and gentlemen. Um, I'm going to start off with a transport. <laughs> I started using my first my Uno to go to the surrounding um, neighbors of South Africa. And then I had to go and find um, Zambia's highest peak. And I had to buy a 4x4. Four four. And I pretty soon discovered that I'm not a 4x4 four four person. And that's why I decided to use local transport. <laughs> It all depended, besides the normal buses and the taxis, sometimes where the mountains were remote, I had to charter a vehicle, and four by four, and then if the, the mountain was very remote and the roads were very, very bad, I chartered a, a, a motorbike. Of course, the chance of getting stuck in, in Africa was like 80%, <laughs> but it, was, it taught me to be a bit more patient, and also it gave me the opportunity to meet the locals. Like in Ethiopia earlier this year, I was on the back of a um, beer truck and I met this lovely lady, of course, she couldn't speak any English, but she sat in front of me and she took my hand. She looked me straight in the face and she said something to me. And of course, I didn't understand what she wanted to tell me and or what she told me. And then I got someone to translate to me, and he said to me, no, she just tell, she said, you're a beautiful person, and now we are one. And that was really such a special moment. Of course, there were some mental challenges. Um, my Portuguese-speaking um, driver left me in this very remote um, village, and instead of hiking 10 kilometers, it became a 60-kilometer hike. And the vultures were really waiting for me there. <laughs> uh, in Uganda last year, I just had this picture of hiking through this past this um, Margarita Glacier. But the rest of the party turned back just before the glacier, and I insisted on going to the top. So it was just me and William, my guide. I didn't realize that it would involve some ice climbing. And it was only when I came to this ice wall that I realized it was really a stupid decision to go with him, because if something happened to him, we would really be in big trouble. And then there was Lagos. Um, when I went there, there was a bit of unrest um, in Lagos, and I found myself midnight, surrounded what, what felt to me like a thousand taxi drivers, waiting for the taxi to fill up so I could go to Togo. I really also discovered that I'm not one made for deserts. After driving more than 3,000 kilometers from Mali to um, Mauritania, I got to the to this little um, village next, next to the mountain, and the people were all also speaking um, only Spanish, and they kept on taking me to the wrong mountain. Um, I, they just couldn't understand why I had to go to that specific mountain, and I lost it a bit. And then, <laughs> in Rwanda, they sent me back to say I can't climb um, Karasimi because of the unrest, and then instead I went to go and climb two um, volcanoes back in Uganda. And it was while I'm standing on top that they told me that I could actually swim to Rwanda. And of course, I jumped in and I swam. <laughs> um, some sad parts was to see how the mountains was really being mined away. This was supposed to be Liberia's highest point in, um, on the Nimba range. And then also the lit on top. It was absolutely, it was terrible. I think the worst was in Mount Kenya, where we picked up 38 bags of litter. And Nelian is a climbing route, and I could only manage to abseil down with one bag of litter, but it was really, really, it was terrible to see it. Not everything was bad about it, because I did realize that it was about um, creating environmental awareness. Um, and in Ghana, this is Ghana's highest point, um, there's quite a lot of school kids that go up there, and I got the guide to get the local people involved, and yeah, we had a clean-up, and I also told them that they must actually tell the kids, you know, not to, to litter on top. And as a direct result of all the litter I saw on the, on the mountains, um, I founded Soap Kids, and so far we've taken out more than 12,500 kids to nature, and we teach them that it's all about respect. Respect for yourself, respect for one another, and then respect for nature. And we also tell them that they have the right to say no if they're grown-ups litter. I can't say I plan all my trips well in advance. In May this year, I decided it was my birthday in two weeks' time, and I decided to go to Ethiopia, first of all, 
because it was a very easy way to, to arrange a track. And also, the only thing I knew about it was that there were a lot of fleas. The Saturday, <laughs> I attended a ladies' tea, and I got so inspired by their talks um, that I decided to add sexy lingerie and a colorful scarf to my hiking list. <laughs> the Wednesday, I booked my flight, and the Friday, I was on the plane, which... <laughs> which didn't leave me with a lot of time to do shopping or to do any packing. And it was only when I started with my hike that I realized that I've left most of the stuff behind. <laughs> of course, I did get the, the two of the latest additions to my hiking list. Um, but I also realized that I could buy a blanket in the first village that we hiked through, and for me, it was really, really so special to meet the people of Ethiopia. I expected a lot of fleas there. That's why I took my dog's electronic flea repellent with. <laughs> but it wasn't necessary. Um, and it was really a big surprise for me. And that is why, how, after two weeks after deciding that I am going to Ethiopia, I woke up and I had enough time to give myself a proper pedicure, and prepare myself, and of course, the sexy undies. And then I, I hiked to the top, where I sang happy birthday to myself, much to the amusement of um, my guide and my porter. <laughs> For me, um, the first step I took on a mountain was really, really special, and it was just like my, my life changed completely. Um, and it was just every encounter with the mountains, it's just, it's mind-blowing. And I just feel so honored that the mountains that I've been to was kind enough to let me watch the sunrise on it. <laughs>